Hello, and thank you for virtually having me as part of today's training. I am excited, even though I can't be with you, to provide you some information on the invaders of Kentucky. Invasive species are, of course, a big focus for everybody in this group that is learning here today. And I know that today's session is focused on laurel wilt and the associated invasive species of that, of that problem. But I think it's important to keep some of these other problems sort of at the forefront of our mind, just so that we are aware that there are always going to be more and more invasive species, seemingly. So I just wanted to cover some of the different ones that we are dealing with here in the state of Kentucky presently that are kind of expanding their range. Also wanted to talk a little bit about some of the ones that are popping up more and more and are going to be an issue in the future, and maybe not even just for uh, f folks that work in a woodland setting. But I also want to talk about some of the ones that are the proverbial wolves at our door. They're outside baying, trying to get in, and we do need to be concerned with as well. The first insect that I want to talk about here today is emerald ash borer. It's one of our stalwart invasives, one of the ones that's been around for quite some time. We've been dealing with it here in the state of Kentucky since 2009 when it was discovered in Fayette County. And you can see that it has spread to much of eastern and central Kentucky based on this map that was kindly provided by the Kentucky Division of Forestry, much thanks to them. They are also updating this map as we continue to see spread of this insect in the state. If you look to the west, you can see that many of our western counties are still not infested with this insect. It's hard to imagine that something that has been around since 2009 has just not fully infiltrated the state. I'm from Indiana and it seemed like this bug took over very quickly where I'm from. I know there's still some holdouts up there, but as a state, we have done very well with the slow the spread program seemingly, and we have sort of halted the progress of this insect at many turns. But you can see that some of those Western counties are now falling prey to the emerald ash borer. We have added three just this year in 2021. The locations of Western spread this year were in Hopkins, as well as Warren and Metcalf County. Metcalf was the one that really kind of broke my heart. It was this island of non-emerald ash borer activity in a sea of green. But now that these changes are happening, now that we're seeing expand into these new territories, we do need to remember that there are people there that need to learn about this pest. We're trying to provide as much information as we can as the extension service. And in, in terms of that, we're trying to help people understand there are systemic treatments that can help yard and street trees to be protected from the emerald ash borer. These injections in some cases or soil treatments and others for smaller trees can be absorbed by the plant and then it can be protected from the EAB as it moves through the area. These are things that are still being done even in the eastern and central portion as well. We are not advocating for folks to stop treating their trees or to stop treating their trees. Uh, it's not gone. This pest is still here. I know that the news cycle is very rapid anymore, but it is something that we need to keep on our radar. We can still treat for it in the east and the central, and people are going to be gearing up to do this in the west. Basically, the big thing is going to be helping people to understand that not all trees should be treated. We want people to prioritize the healthiest trees on their property. We want them to prioritize the ones that provide the most benefits. So the ones that provide the most shade, um, help to cool areas off, the ones that provide the most enjoyment, the biggest ones that they love to have around. If those are the ones that they wanna save, they need to evaluate the health of those trees to make sure there aren't things like storm damage or stem girdling roots. And if those trees are healthy and okay, they can go ahead with the treatment. Otherwise, it might be good for folks to try and think about removing and replacing. There are great lists of trees that people can peruse to see what they can choose in order to enhance the biodiversity of their neighborhood and have something beautiful in their yard. There are also some invasive insects that we get asked a lot about here in the Extension Service that aren't in the state of Kentucky, but do generate a lot of interest. Invasive species are always going to grab people's attention, particularly when you give them the colorful sobriquet of murder hornet. Uh, the murder hornet is something that I get asked a ton of questions about. If I showed you my inbox right now, I guarantee there's like 10 emails of people claiming that they have found the first one in the state of Kentucky. I just want to say that the Asian giant hornet, which is the real uh, common species name for this insect, has not been found in the state of Kentucky. It has not been found anywhere nearby either. Uh, this is something that has only been found in British Columbia, Canada, and the state of Washington. 
There's currently no consensus on how exactly these insects were brought to North America. There's lots of theories about how they ended up here, but it's something that has really captured a lot of people's attention. You may remember in the early days of the pandemic, this was one of those, the next bad thing in 2020 that people were talking about. And it is a very weird and sort of disturbing situation we find ourselves in. One of the things that people talk a lot about is the fact that they may kill folks and that Asian giant hornets are, are something that cause over 50 deaths every year in their native range. That is true. I would point out that we see about 50 to 70 deaths annually from bees and wasps here in the United States as well. So it's not outside of the realm of possibility. Uh, of the realm of imagination for this to be something that would happen here as well. But it is weird. It's something that frightens people. Just look at that face. It's a one that only a mom really could love. Huge chewing mandibles there in the front. Look at that rear end. They're packing quite the gun, quite the stinger at the tip of their abdomen. Just imagine that being driven into your flesh. I have read reports from Asian scientists who have been stung by this, talking about the sensation. The most colorful one that I remember is the description of it being like a red hot nail piercing your flesh. So it is not something that's fun. We don't want to see it get here, not just for human health reasons, but also because of the potential impacts that these can have on European honeybees. Asian giant hornets do prey upon these honey-making insects that we rear as livestock. What happens is in the autumn, the hornets switch from their normal hunting habits of looking for caterpillars and other things that they chew up into basically focusing on honeybees. That's what they're going after. And they kill them by catching them in midair and then making bee meatballs. This is what the actual scientific literature calls them. This is not a larcenism where I'm coming up with a weird way of talking about it, but they slice the heads off, they slice the legs off, and they crunch up what's left into this bee meatball. They also invade the nests of honeybees. You can see about 30 of these hornets will go into a, a honeybee hive that contains about 30,000 workers. And in about 30 minutes, they will have wiped everybody out. It is called a slaughter phase where they enter the hive and perform this activity. And there's actually videos of this. This is from Nat Geo Wild. You can see this hornet has chopped this poor bee in half as it uh, starts to invade. What's going to happen is they're going to go inside they will do this to most of the bees that are in there. They'll eat some of them, but they're also there to harvest the honey and harvest the bee larvae that are inside so they can take those back home and feed them to their young. So this is not in the state of Kentucky, but it is one that we get a lot of questions about. Another invasive pest that hasn't been found in the state of Kentucky yet, but is on a lot of people's radar, is the box tree moth. This is an invasive pest from Asia. It has become a widespread problem on the European continent. It's found in over 25 different nations. It first appeared on that continent in Germany in the mid-2000s, and ever since has been causing problems for boxwoods across that area. Boxwoods are a very popular ornamental shrub. They seem to be very popular in the state of Kentucky, I will say. Uh, when I look around at the landscape, I notice quite a few of them. On the left, you can see what people are hoping for with a boxwood. And on the right, you can see what happens when it's been exposed to box tree moth. This is from Europe. You can see that the leaves have been completely ruined and skeletonized. They will also go down and girdle the, the trunk, and they leave behind this mess of webbing as they feed on the plant. This is something that we had hoped to not have to deal with in the state for a while, but unfortunately, that kind of stuff, uh, you don't always get what you want, right? Previously, uh, there was only one spot in North America that was considered infested. This was in Toronto, Canada. In May 2021, though, this changed when a shipment came from Canada, and there were three fines in the United States in Michigan, Connecticut, and South Carolina. The USDA was dispatched, local agencies were dispatched. These were quickly rounded up and destroyed. None of them were found in Kentucky, but there were some materials that were destroyed just in case here. Unfortunately, as a result of this, it would appear though that there has been a new infestation confirmed in Western New York. Uh, this was just announced a few weeks ago. So this is something that is probably going to be here sooner rather than later. If you want to know what the adult moth looks like, there it is in the center image here. Kind of broadly fan-shaped, I would argue. A brownish-black border across the wings. 
a triangle of white in the middle that goes across both wings, the front and the back. There's also this sort of comma-like shape that comes in from the border. They look a lot like the melon worm moth, which lives in the United States, uh, but there are some subtle differences. But this is the adult form. The immature form you can see on the right there, kind of a greenish yellow caterpillar. It has yellow stripes and black stripes down the side, black dots, slightly hairy. It is not a very attractive looking caterpillar, I would argue. It's also not very distinct looking. The eggs, on the other hand, which you see on the bottom side of this boxwood leaf, I do think are semi-diagnostic. They look like egg yolks that have been glued to the bottom of the leaf. This is where you will find them located after the female has gone through. So if you see a pattern like this on the leaf, uh, that is indicative of a potential box tree moth problem. The caterpillars, like I said, not very distinct, but the webbing that they create is that webbing can help us to differentiate this pest from the others that are very common on boxwoods here in Kentucky. So in a clockwise motion, starting from the upper left, we have box tree moth damage. You can see those leaves have been skeletonized. Some of them have been eaten all the way through, and now just that kind of mid vein is left. You can also see the webbing that they leave behind. If you look next to that image in the upper right hand corner, we have boxwood leaf miner damage. This is an insect that we deal with every year. The adult flies lay their eggs, their immature maggots live inside of the leaves between the top and bottom layer and consume the leaf material inside, which creates this blister like appearance. I think that this vaguely resembles what we see with the box tree moth, but it lacks that key webbing diagnostic characteristic. So if you get questions on this, or if you see boxwoods looking kind of funky, that is a good indicator is looking for that webbing that will help you to separate this out. Also help with things like boxwood psyllid, which creates that cupping that we see at the tip of the new growth. Other things that can resemble box tree moth would include winter kill, salt kill, that we see. I've gotten lots of images of boxwoods from across the state this summer that appear to have absorbed a lot of salt that was used in de-icer. And unfortunately, they've become ghost-like. They're kind of see-through. They don't look very healthy. Most of them are dead, uh, but that damage does resemble the box tree moth as well. So this is just something that we need to prepare for. We'll have to create a, a management plan once it does arrive here. So when we understand its life cycle in this state, a little bit better. The final insect I wanna talk about today is the spotted lanternfly. This is another one that's kind of on our border. I'll show you a map here in a moment that just highlights how close it is to Kentucky. This is another invasive species from Asia. It was first confirmed in Pennsylvania. It may have been introduced as early as 2012 on infected nursery stock in that state. Very interesting looking insect. You can see some of that bold coloration here. The fashion faux pas of mixing stripes with spots as well. And you can also see in this image next to the state how it had sort of a cicada-like uh, form when viewed from the side. They are related to those insects. They're in the same order. You can see the current distribution as of September 7th. Three most concerning finds for us would be the one in eastern Ohio, the one in southern Indiana and in Switzerland County, and then the one up by Cleveland in northern Ohio. It is inching closer and closer as we speak to the state of Kentucky. This is something that I think is fascinating. It has a lot of people on edge. There are lots of things that we can be on the lookout for though. One is the eggs of this insect. They are laid on just about any hard surface, including vines, tree trunks, fence posts, stones, homes, lawn furniture. The mud that coats them is there to protect the eggs. And the appearance of these was very consternating to a lot of people recently with the fall armyworm outbreak that we've been having they left behind similar looking egg patches and a lot of people were very concerned that they had discovered this invasive pest rather than that annoying caterpillar other things to be on the lookout for include the interesting looking nymphs they are red black and white with spots on their body they are noticeable and different from most other nymphs that we would be finding the adults as well when in motion you can see that bright red on the back also those mixtures of colors there, very different than any other insect that we have in the state. Sometimes confused for things like the leopard moth and a few others, but a very distinct looking critter, no doubt. 
The spotted lanternfly is a problem because it does feed on over 70 different host species. In particular, they attack hardwood trees, but they can also get on fruits and vegetables and hops. Their preferred host is the tree of heaven, another invasive species though, and one that we can use as kind of a sentinel for this pest. One of the big problems with these is the fact that they produce a lot of honeydew. The honeydew squirts out of their rear end. You'll see it here in a moment with one of these insects. I think it's this one right here towards the center of the image. But they will squirt out this honeydew. It's a mixture of sugar water, basically, and they produce this as their fecal material. It gets everywhere, and you can see it's accumulated on the leaves around the infestation in southern Indiana. The air hummed with insects that were coming to drink this up. They love this sugary butt juice, things like bees and flies, and it introduces black sooty mold. With that, I want to say I appreciate your time today. Thanks for watching the video. Sorry again that I couldn't join you in person. I hope that I've introduced some concepts about these invasive species or just let them be on your radar a little bit more. But if I can help in any way, let me know. Or if I can answer any questions, you can see my email and Twitter contact here on the screen.